column in the New York Post earlier this month, Victor, the headline, 10 Ways American Culture and Ways of Life is Under Assault. And the 10 of them are, and I'll just blaze these as quickly as I can, one, free expression, two, weaponization of justice, three, the attack on the Supreme Court, four, the media democratic fusion, five, the destruction of common law, six, the erosion of the military, seven, sexes, that's sex is plural, eight, race, not class, nine, debt is a construct, and 10, universities. And let's jump forward to universities as that's most relevant to our audience here. Here's what you wrote, quote, the role of a university is to create a brief safe space in which graduates can leave with proper training about the terrible history of the United States and the ways in which it must be dismantled and then be rebuilt by the properly trained experts from the ground up. Is it really that bad? Yeah, I mean, I was a graduate student here in the PhD program in classical languages in 1975, and I think that I was the only center right or conservative student. All the faculty were left wing, but I never knew that. So when we were talking about Achilles, or we were reading the Odyssey, or we were reading Herodotus' history in Greek, or Tacitus in Latin, or writing in Latin or Greek, all of these great scholars were men of the left, but they didn't feel that they were gonna be deductive, it was inductive. We're gonna teach you the skills, we're gonna give you the body of knowledge. We wish you would probably have our world view, but if you don't, you at least have a, an analytical, rational way to come to an inductive, and that seems to be gone, so I would say that today, if I went to a classroom in Stanford and I gave two lectures, one would be the glory of Jesus Christ, and I want all of you to accept him as your savior, you would be kicked out and you would be reported. If I said it is indisputable that climate change is completely man-made, we've never seen any heating and the cooling of the planet like it, we have to take drastic action, and you're all going to, there's not going to be any objection at all. On the contrary, if you said, not just that you were proselytizing Christianity, but you said, I don't believe that we are the first generation to heat up the planet, nor do I believe that we have the power to radically cool it, I do believe we can contribute to it, I think you'd be in big trouble. Big, big trouble. I can tell you that <laughs> from personal experience on things like that, you'd be in big trouble. There is a historian at Princeton, Victor. He's a fellow classicist like yourself. His name is Dan L. Padilla Peralta, and he wants to end the teaching of classics in universities. This seems to be a problem, Victor. If you do not learn about Greece, you do not learn about the roots of democracy. If you do not learn about Rome, you don't learn about the roots of the Republic. You also don't learn how these two rather creative societies were very openly critical of their leaders, how they lampooned their leadership, in other words, they engaged in free speech. As a classicist, what does the future hold for the teaching of the ancients? Well, I co-authored a book, uh, well, 23 years ago called Who Killed Homer? And I predicted that on the present trajectory, the classics, classics as a discipline would be destroyed in 50 years. And that was not just the precursors to woke, but also it was a narrow academic and people were not trying to expand the field from the right. The philologists were not trying to make their work relevant. But on the left, in those days, three decades ago, people were using a jargon. In those days, it was Lacan, Derrida, and Foucault. So instead of studying the cult of Aphrodite in Asia Minor, it was the phallocentric uh, construction of manhood, and it was all from an ideological point of view that was to be on question. And you could see where this was going to go. In the case of Mr. Peralta, I know he was a Stanford undergraduate. I've been a frequent target of his criticism. He got a Princeton, uh, Stanford PhD, excuse me, he was a Princeton undergraduate. But what, uh, what was disturbing about his attack on classics was he was an immigrant student who was given a scholarship to go to to prep school, and he did very good under Amer very well under a meritocratic system. Then he was given a scholarship to go to Princeton to study classics, and he was trained by some of the great classicists, one of them who was Joshua Katz, controversial now, but a great classicist. Then he went to Stanford on a full scholarship. And then he got almost immediately something unheard of in the classical profession. He got a tenure-track job at Princeton that is unheard of in classics. There's five to six 
uh, people for every one job. And so what does he do with that privilege? Immediately when he's tenured and he's got this exalted position and he has this whole history of people trying to help an immigrant, then he turns on the whole field and says, it needs to be destroyed. And by the way, all of you poor people out there that are $200,000 in debt, that are getting a PhD in classics, I'm gonna ensure you're never gonna have a job again because I'm gonna blow up the field now that I'm on top of it. And by the way, I'll just drift over to comp lit because they'll never fire me. And that's, that's how, that was his operating assumptions. And more importantly, it is, if you destroy the teaching of the Greek language and Latin by extension, there's no way you're ever going to transmit the classical legacy in its entirety because you need these experts that from time to time refigure, recalibrate, they find new archeological remains, they find new inscriptions, they find palimpsests with new texts and it requires a, a, a great degree of Greek. And this is well beside the value which we talked about in Who Killed Homer that if a person takes Greek and Latin and they understand the grammar and the syntax and the composition they are innately better writers of English, they read better in English, they speak better, and they enjoy literature to a degree that's unsurpassed. So it has practical uh, ramifications and value outside of the expertise in classics. Okay, I'd like one of these bright people to tell me who Rishi Sunak is. His hand went up first. You can yell it out if you want to. He gave me a call. Okay. <laughs> right, he's the Prime Minister of Britain. What's he's that? The, he's the British Prime Minister, and he gave me a comb. I didn't hear the question. Gave him a comb. And what is, what is Mr. Uh, Sunak's connection to Stanford? Um, he, <clears throat> I lost my voice, forgive me. He got his MBA here, although none of his professors remember him. Dr. Raj, is that true? Forgive me. I wasn't here when my students <laughs> do remember him, but my colleagues were asked whether they remembered him, and nobody remembered him. <laughs> but he, he sold himself running, running for prime minister saying, I, I'll stand up, I'm sorry, that he said, I can make Britain seem like a startup business. I studied at Stanford. It was brilliant. I had these brilliant professors at the GSB. And then Financial Times went to the GSB, and none of those professors remembered him. But regardless, he's the prime minister. Yes. Isn't it great when you have a smart audience? What's that? Isn't it great when you have a smart audience to yeah. work with? Okay, I mentioned Rishi, uh, Rishi Sunak for this reason. About a year ago at this time, Great Britain was going through considerable political turmoil. In the course of about six weeks, they blazed through three prime ministers, Sunak becoming the third prime minister, now currently holding the job. He is a Stanford MBA. He's a young guy, I think he's 43 years old uh, as well. Uh, very interesting, he's a Tory. During uh, his campaign, if you wanna call it, his, his advocating to become the prime minister, he was asked about a policy called Greenbelt, which those of you who are familiar in Great Britain, this is you have a city, but then you try to build a green area around the city for two reasons. Number one, so the urbanites kind of feel they're close to the country, but secondly, it cuts down on sprawl. So you don't have, like if you fly into Washington DC and you see ungodly sprawls, you come to Dulles Airport, the Brits want to avoid this. So Sunak was asked about uh, green, Greenbelt, and here's what he wrote, uh, what he answered, quote, What's the point in stopping the bulldozers in the green belt if we allow left-wing agitators to take a bulldozer to our history, our traditions, and our fundamental values? Whether it's pulling down statues of historic figures, replacing the school curriculum with anti-British propaganda, or rewriting the English language so we can't even use words like man, woman, or mother without being told we're offending someone. It's not us who are the aggressors. We have zero interest in fighting a so-called culture war, but we are determined to end the brainwashing, the vandalism, and the finger pointing. And then you go over to Mr. Sunak's Twitter account, excuse me, his X account, and he wrote the following while he was trying to become prime minister, quote, let's restore trust, rebuild the economy, and reunite the country. So question, Victor, how do you deal with wokeism in Britain or the United States without actually having a culture war? He thinks you can do it peacefully, but can you do this peacefully? I think you have to have a, a common agreement that whatever your differences in the present, you don't war in the past. I mean, there's obviously people in Eastern Europe, when they were freed from a god-awful communism, they had the right to take down Stalin's statue, or, and the same is true of Hitler. But 
In our history, it seems to me that, I'll give you one example of living in an Orwellian world. I came um, to the Hoover Tower where my office is one day and I said to somebody, what happened to Hunipio Serra Plaza? I thought I was a, from Mars or something. He said, oh, it's been renamed. And I said, well, what happened? Why did, who did this? Why? There's a Hunipio Serra Boulevard. And they said, well, he whipped Indians. I, I, I said he was a missionary. He was in chronic ill health. He walked the length of California. He had sins and he had benefits. He tried as, in the time to be enlightened as he saw being enlightened, but he did some very great things. He was a complex character. But then the thing that was very interesting about woke is it's always selective. So nobody wants to change the Nipio Serra Boulevard. So they virtue signal, they do? Yeah, they virtue signal by doing it um, with a plaza. So if you're gonna go full woke is what I'm saying. We'll get to the questions. Yeah, if you wanna go to full woke, it seems to me that why go half-heartedly? So here's Stanford University, it's a great university. And Leland Stanford was a railroad tycoon. He was a man of action, he had flaws. Jane Stanford was an uh, interesting character. She was devoted to learning. They spent their fortune and this is what we got. But according to Woke, you could say that Leland Stanford wrote letters that were by present standards anti-Asian. He said it was a peril, we have to take people back after they, very racist. So what I'm getting at is that no one ever says we have to rename Stanford University as an indigenous university. So what woke does is, it says to themselves, we, we are gonna be selective, but we don't want to anger people or do the whole woke trip that would either hurt our self-interest or the left. So we're not gonna talk about Yale's ancestry. We're not gonna ever rename Yale or not gonna, but we're gonna go over here and topple this statue and then tell everybody that we're woke. And that's historically in tune with what this selectivity is. It's always used for contemporary political purposes. As to the quotes, what this MP was saying that no present generation owns the past and they don't have enough, they don't have wisdom enough to go back in the past and erase the entire th cargo and say, this is what we think has to disappear. And you don't know what the value is and what would be valuable for the society. You've set yourself up as judge, jury, and executioner of the past. And the past is not, as I said, it's not melodrama, it's tragedy. So it's, an, it's a rich tapestry and you're igniting it for the rest of generations. And so it's, uh, there's an arrogance to woke, I think, that people don't talk about. It's a very arrogant idea and it claims the moral high ground. There's one last wrinkle I'd say is that everything in education is a tension between commission and omission. It's a zero sum game. So if you spend a lot of capital and labor and time with diversity, equity, inclusion, monitoring, and wokeness, it's very similar to the Soviet commissariat, that you have people that are looking at syllabi to see that it's correct. You have people that are making sure that on hiring committees, everybody has a woke statement. You're looking at promotion and tenure on basis. There's a whole industry now that is not productive, and why, what do I mean? Are they teaching languages and philosophy and math? No, they're monitoring and adjudicating, and it's not productive labor. It's like the Soviet Red Army. They had commissars in almost every company size unit, and their job was to make sure that tactics and strategy were not just based on military efficacy, but they reflected Marxist ideology and they were incompetent, and the first 12 days of the German invasion, they almost lost the war. And what did Stalin do? He got rid of the commissars. Because Stalin did, his own people, he said, this is too inefficient. And so what we're doing now is not only are we being divisive, but we're spending time and capital, and yet when you look at young students and you meet them, and they come, if I speak at a university on any topic, but say a military history, 
they'll say things like, well, wasn't this person bad or racist or sexist? And you say, yes, but let's have a conversation where we can relate to each other, such as, would you please tell me what the Battle of Guadalcanal was like? Nothing. Can you please tell me what the difference between a B-29 and a B-17? Nothing. Can you please tell me who George Patton was? Nothing. Can you tell me what FDR's four freedoms were? Nothing. So it's a whole body of knowledge that's disappeared from the college curriculum, and it has to be replaced by what? By students in their young years adjudicating what is good knowledge and what is bad knowledge, but they don't have the tools to make those distinctions other than an, an, an ideology that's been f infused into them. So the worst combination is arrogance and ignorance. So it's, um, it's very tragic that we're losing a whole generation of students that are highly opinionated, highly vocal, and yet they don't even have the tools because they haven't had that classical instruction that their, that their teachers did. Many of the teachers who are rebelling against the system were classically trained in languages, philosophy, science, mathematics, and then they said, you know what, this was all bias, so I'm going to not teach that. So they really shortchanged this generation, I, it seems to me. They didn't, as good stewards of knowledge, they didn't pass on all of the value that they got. They made an arbitrary tris, uh, decision that they were going to pander the students and they destroyed that whole legacy. Final question, Victor, and we'll go to questions, and fear not, you will be first. Uh, the question is this, Victor, is the pendulum swinging? Is the fever broke, to use a Victorism? Have we reached peak wokeism? I note if you look at Netflix, Disney, Warner Brothers, they have all let go of their lead DEI, diversity, equity, uh, inclusiveness executives. If you look at uh, job losses within the corporate sector in America, more DEI officials are being fired than non-DEI. Do you think we've hit the high point here? I think so. I think we're getting close to peak woke, anything that can't go on, I think Herb Stein said that, won't go on. And it's unsustainable. If we want the current lifestyle, prosperity, security of the United States, and it, it was based on a meritocracy. And if you're gonna destroy that meritocracy, and that can be everything from requiring pilots uh, in, training programs for United that 50% will be admitted to the pilot training based on their superficial appearance. If you're gonna do things, and that's across the board, it won't be sustainable. People will start to see the society break down. I think we're already seeing it. If you look at San Francisco, it's a perfect example of what woke can do, whether you look at it in jurisprudence, or homelessness, or smash and grab, or high taxes. But people who were very left wing said, this can't go on and I can't save it, so I'm leaving. So 30% of the stores are, are empty. And when you see the popular culture, what I'm worried about is that if people keep pressing and saying, we're going to cancel, deplatform, shadow ban, dox, people that we disagree with, and we're going to do this often on the basis of race, then other people are going to say, are we now in a tribal society? So we're going to start identifying by race? Well then, it's like nuclear proliferation. If everybody's gonna go nuclear, I'm gonna go nuclear. That's what they think. And contrary to superficial uh, university uh, orthodoxy, there's great diversity within races. You don't want them to be, uh, there is, I mean, when I leave Fresno, California, and I see somebody who's the child of the Oklahoma diaspora, who hasn't had one person in his family ever go to college, and I come over here and see somebody with a PhD or a JD, who's very wealthy, and happens to be, they both happen to be white, I can tell you they have zero in common. Zero in common. They would not like each other, they have nothing in common. But to lump all these people together, and that's true of every race, into these collectives, it, it's not sustainable. And you can see people, whether it's the Anheuser-Busch uh, pushback, or the Target pushback, or the Disney pushback, or the LA Dodgers, or all of a sudden we hear a song that is the number one on the charts of every single hip hop, rap, contemporary, classics, popular, this 
you know, Oliver Young, rich men north of Richmond. All of a sudden, it, it's a phenomenon. Why? Because it's somebody saying, class is what matters, not race, class, and we're tired of being told what to do. And that, why would anybody want to listen to that except people are getting very tired? And I think there, every once in a while, things jump the shark. We saw it at Stanford University with a law school incident. So when that federal judge was shouted down and a administrator hijacked the lecture as if it was spontaneous, but then produced a text that was pre-written with the expectation that the following would happen as scripted, and then joined the students in denying this person an opportunity to speak, people, I mean, people said, this, is, this doesn't work anymore, this is chaos. And it, it can't go on like this. And I think, of, and I've been here 20 years, I think I've never had more phone calls and email than, than any other incident than that. Um, that was sort of the epitome and people said, if we continue with this, we will not have a law school because you won't be able to say anything and you're gonna to have to have a Maoist czar to approve every type of word vocabulary. And then the Stanford, uh, you know, vocabulary list where we were told you can't use the word immigrant, you can't use the word patriotic. So, it, mother, I think mother made the list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The revolution gets into the Jacobin phase. We are now in the Jacobin phase of 1792 and three, the reign of terror, and there's going to be a Thermidor reaction. It's already happening. And let's just pray that the reaction is moderate and tries to t tamp it down. But if the woke revolution keeps going and going, we're gonna get a backlash. And it's gonna, not gonna be pretty. Historically, it's not pretty. And that's gonna be something we should all be worried about. 